Paul Copan is the Pledger Family Chair of Philosophy and Ethics at Palm Beach Atlantic University and for six years served as president of the Evangelical Philosophical Society. He received his PhD of Philosophy and Religion from Marquette University. He is the author and editor of over 30 books and has contributed essays to books, both scholarly and popular, and authored a number of articles in professional journals. Please welcome Paul Copan. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you all. It's a great privilege to team up with the Reasons to Believe uh, team and uh, my first time here with them. So I'm, I'm grateful and privileged uh, to participate in this. And good to meet some of you uh, as we've been sitting over meals and uh, coffee and so forth. It's been great to interact and rub shoulders with you all. I'm going to be talking about the topic that is perhaps familiar to a lot of us, the idea of tolerance, the notion of relativism. I don't know if my, am I showing up here? I guess I need to figure out how this works. There we go. Uh, that we are living in an era that emphasizes coexisting, emphasizes tolerance, that this is the cardinal virtue in our postmodern world, that this is what people are uh, appealing to. And so what I want to do is speak about this issue with regard to how we respond in truth and love to this relativistic mindset. So as we go through, we want to look at not just some of the intellectual issues, but also the relational ones as well. As we've spoken about 1 Peter 3.15, uh, that we ought to be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks us for a reason for the hope that lies within us, but doing so with gentleness and respect. Unfortunately, as you get to the relativist's mindset, we see a lot of what the late Pope John Paul said about relativism, that there is a certain tyranny, the dictatorship of relativism, he called it. If you believe that there is such a thing as truth, you are considered dangerous, arrogant, narrow-minded, imperialistic. This is the stuff that goes along with claiming that something is true for all people. So we are living in an era of truth decay. <laughs> and it is not only with regard to truth, but also morality. Not simply that's just true for you, but not for me, but also that's just right for you, but not for me. And this has various manifestations. And a lot of times when I'm speaking on university campuses, this sort of a thing comes out. I was speaking at the University of Connecticut a number of years ago, UConn, and uh, actually lived uh, very close to the University of Connecticut for a number of my teenage years and beyond. And I was speaking there, and outside, while I was speaking, there was this women's march. It was called Take Back the Night. And the women were out there, and men with them, I'd assume. Uh, they were chanting, two, four, six, eight, rape is an act of hate. And certainly would agree uh, with this sort of a, a mindset, the resistance to that. And we've heard about that uh, from Joe as she was speaking yesterday, uh, and the degradation and the violation uh, of, uh, of, of, of women. But what was interesting, and I told the group that was actually to whom I was speaking that day, I said, isn't it interesting that you have this group of people so angry and upset and protesting rape, but yet they're going to go to their classrooms tomorrow and their professors are going to tell them that there is no objective morality, that there is no such thing as objective truth. Here's another scenario. I was at a school in upstate New York, SUNY Oswego, and as I was speaking, uh, there was a kind of an interesting encounter that I had. There was a professor who allowed me to speak in his 20th century intellectual history class. And I spoke there and had a very good exchange with him. Everything seemed to be uh, fine. And, and then I left campus and the professor came and told his students after I had gone that they shouldn't believe anything that Dr. Copan said in class. 
because he was talking about knowledge, and knowledge is something that we just can't have. We can have opinions, but we can't have knowledge. One of the students in the class, happened to be a Christian, said, well, how do you know that? <laughs> he said, well, it's complicated, it's too hard to explain. <laughs> well, here's another uh, scenario. I was at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Worcester, Massachusetts. By the way, that is near Webster, Massachusetts, where there is Webster Lake, which is also known as, and I kid you not, Lake Chagagagog, Manchagagog, Chabunagungamog. That is the name, of, the Indian name. Lake Chagagagog, Manchagagog, Chabunagungamog. Apparently meaning you fish on your side, I'll fish on my side, and no one fishes in the middle. So uh, it's right off of Interstate 395. And uh, has nothing to do with my story, but uh, it, it, it is a point of interest. But I was speaking to a group of students. It was a very large crowd, and they were probably my most hostile crowd that I'd ever faced. I actually, the next day, I ended up speaking at Harvard University, and they were tame in comparison to what I got at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. But there's one guy who stood up during the Q&A time, and he said, now you've talked a lot about truth and knowledge. Now, the truth may exist, but I don't see how you can say that you know the truth. I says, well, it sounds to me as though you believe that you have a virtue that I don't have. It seems to me as though you are holding the superior position between the two of us in your estimation. It seems to me as though you know that you are correct and that I am incorrect. It seems to me that you know that you can't know. And the conversation went on from there. He kind of suddenly switched the subject to homosexuality. And, uh, but uh, so it was a, kind of an interesting, interesting twist. But, but these are the sorts of conversations that you will have. Sometimes they're uh, the true for you, but not for me sorts of things. Sometimes the, the morality thing, that that's just right for you, but not for me, as though there is no sweeping uh, more universal moral norm uh, that we ought to be paying attention to. Well, when we look at relativism, first of all, we need to understand that relativism is self-refuting. It is a view that claims to be true for all people. It's not just true for me or true for you. In fact, when you think about it, when somebody says true for you but not for me, that person's assuming that that relativism pertains to at least two people, you and me. I, in case, if you want to explore this a little bit more, you can take a look at the book that I wrote called True For You But Not For Me that goes into a number of these different uh, conversations and, and points that I'm going to be making here in very condensed form. So J.P. Moreland uh, did me a great favor of, of kind of paving the way to talk about truth and what truth is. So, but I wanted to do, give a brief review here, uh, defining what is relativism and, and, and what is truth. When we talk about relativism, we're talking about something being good or right for one person or culture, but that's not necessarily good for another's culture. Uh, that goodness is relative, truth is relative to an individual or to cultures. And, uh, you know, Robbie Zacharias has sometimes said, in some cultures, they love their neighbors, in some cultures, they eat the neighbors, which would you prefer? This notion of relativism is one that is pernicious. How many of you have had experiences talking with the true for you but not for, for me sorts of relativists? It's all a matter of perspective. It's all just opinion. That's just your interpretation. There is no such thing as knowledge. There is no such thing as truth for all people. It's simply what we happen to, you know, we just have different perspectives on this. And you could be, you know, I mean, yeah, you just have your view. In fact, I was on one campus, I was speaking, and there was one person who said to me during the Q&A time, he said, when people in the Middle Ages or whenever believed that the earth was flat, and this is a, a caricature of what actually took place in history, 
But when people believed that the earth was flat, that was true for them back then. I said, so, uh, so for example, I, I said, well, what, if, what, what would happen if you got people who are starting to come around to believing that the earth is round? I wasn't, this, this conversation, I didn't plan it uh, this way, but I'll just uh, mention this the whole idea of the earth being flat. There's a little pun in there for you. Um, but uh, it, you know, as I was speaking, I said, what about people who happen to be believing this and you've got some people who believe it and some don't? Is it, you know, is it partially flat? Is it you know, partially round? Is it ra flat for some people but round for others? You know, what's, the, what's the situation here? I mean, it just, it, it, it's kind of a silly sort of a thing that reality is somehow some t based on what I happen to be thinking about and nothing beyond my own mind. And this is what relativism really is, that truth is dependent upon my mind, it's dependent upon the constructs that I make up. Well, as JP mentioned, he said truth is a matchup, a correspondence between a statement or a story and the way things really are. Reality is the truth maker. It's sort of like betting on a horse. I'm not advocating this, by the way. But it's not because you've bet on the horse that it's going to win. Your bet is successful only if the horse wins, if there is that matchup between the bet that you've made and the horse that wins. In the same way, reality is that truth maker. When we look at the actual world, when we look at what, the, what things are really like, that is what actually grounds truth or falsity. So, uh, so again, if something is false, it is because it is out of sync with the way things really are. Maybe you've seen that, uh, that uh, video of Wallace and Gromit called A Grand Day Out. Have you ever seen that? But it's a, a fun movie. We enjoyed watching it with our kids as they're growing up. We've got six kids. And, uh, and so in, one, in this episode, Wallace, the inventor, and his dog, who is smarter than Wallace, the inventor, they, they are, they've built a rocket ship. They're going up to the moon because, Wallace says, everybody knows the moon is made of cheese. And they go bringing all sorts, you know, they bring crackers because they want to have cheese. And finally, when they get there and Wallace breaks off a moon rock and puts it on his cracker and starts crunching it, he says, it's not like no cheese I've ever tasted. <laughs> and uh, and we, we laugh because we say, obviously, uh, there's a, a disconnect here. It's a false belief. The moon is not made of cheese. So that belief is false. It is not grounded in reality. Something else to be said about relativism. Relativists are absolutists, that they take their belief that sounds so tolerant, that sounds so generous, but yet they take their own view to be absolute and true for all people. So we have what is this, this contradiction between what the relativist is telling us and the very thing that he accuses Christians of, being narrow-minded and arrogant and so forth, actually applies logically back to them as well. So what are some of the slogans that relativists will throw out? Well, these absolutist slogans, think about it. Basically, they're essentially saying that if you are not a relativist, you are in error. You're mistaken, Hail Sneezer. <clears throat> if you point out that someone else is wrong, then you know, that's, you know, that's, that's a problem. That's a moral problem. How dare you say that someone else is wrong. That is arrogant. There is this absolute, the assumption that all views are equally acceptable. Another one, you shouldn't impose your morality on others. You ever heard that before? 
Who are you to impose your morality on others? Well, notice what they're assuming here. They're assuming that there is this moral standard that should never be violated by anyone. Let me give you an example. I was at, uh, again, back to SUNY Oswego, this uh, university in upstate New York. And I was doing a question and answer time, and there was a, a young woman who stood up, and she said, you're being ethnocentric. <laughs> and so I said, you know, please explain, why am I being ethnocentric? She said, you believe that your morality should be imposed on everybody. Now notice the universal claim that is being made here that is always wrong everywhere for anyone to be ethnocentric. So I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, let's say you're walking down a dark alley and that there is someone who is ready to, about to rape you or attack you, but there is a bystander who would be willing to help. Would you want that bystander to impose his morality on your attacker? And she said, you're distorting what I'm saying. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not distorting what you're saying. What, what I'm trying to do is point out that it's very easy to talk about morality being relative when it's out there. But when it affects me, when it violates me, when it violates my rights, that's when we start to get upset. That's when we call something evil. The assumption that we ought to be tolerant is yet another uh, you know, another assumption that relativists make that they take to be true, morally obligatory for all people. And we'll come back to what that is. You shouldn't judge. Again, some of these terms that are thrown around by people, they never define them. And it's often helpful to ask the question, what exactly do you mean by tolerant? What do you mean by judge? It's just very helpful to get a definition because they can just throw out those emotive words and without a definition, uh, you're playing a losing game. There's the assumption that you ought to be open-minded. Now, let's go back to that professor who said that you can't have knowledge. Think about it. Here he is teaching in a university where knowledge is impossible. What are people going to school for if not to learn, to know? You know, just think of the money you could save if you found out before you went to school that I'm not going to learn anything anywhere. There is no knowledge. Why bother going? Anyway, the paradoxes of modern education. It's arrogant, bigoted, imperialistic, as we've seen, uh, to be ethnocentric. Also, another assumption is this, and JP touched on this yesterday, that we don't have access to reality. The assumption by the postmodern or the relativist that we can't have access to what is real presupposes an access to reality. How would you know that unless you had access to reality to be able to tell me that that is the case? So again, we see all sorts of paradoxes cropping up here, all sorts of contradictions. And as the uh, philosopher uh, Roger Scruton uh, has said, that basically if a person tells you that there are no truths, that all truth is merely relative, He's asking you not to believe him, so don't. <laughs> a very simple solution. I was, uh, you know, I have a daughter who uh, is now in Madrid, Spain, but she was going to a, a high school, and it was in an English class, and it was a, probably a top-ranked school, international baccalaureate, I think at the time it was about seventh in the nation, public school. And so she was in this English class, and the, the teacher, Ask the students of about 30 students, how many of you think that there is no such thing as truth? And in this class of students who would end up going to Ivy League schools and so forth, 28 out of the 30 of them said, there's no such thing as truth. They raised their hands. So the teacher asked a young man who didn't raise his hand, he didn't know, really know what to say, and then asked my daughter, Valerie, why didn't you raise your hand? And Valerie said, well, if you say that there's no such thing as truth, you're basically saying that it's true, that there is no truth, and that's self-contradictory. <laughs> the teacher said, exactly right. But yet, all of these 
students are just being duped by this culture of relativism. They're just buying into this idea that just, yeah, that's just true for you, but not for me. When we're dealing with relativism, uh, think of the ice cream flavor dilemma. If truth is being treated as simply a matter of perspective, as being a matter of opinion, it's kind of like an ice cream flavor that you prefer. I mean, I prefer Ben & Jerry's New York Super Fudge Chunk. That's my favorite ice cream. All right, have some amens here. Good. <laughs> but if it's simply a matter of my own opinion, then relativism is going to be trivial in that case. Well, it's not as though I'm saying Ben & Jerry's is the flavor that all people ought to appreciate. But this is just what I prefer. I can, I can appreciate you know, that you like another flavor, but no big deal if we disagree on what we prefer. That's fine. That's just how tastes work. But most people don't think that truth is just a matter of opinion. They believe that their views are right, and if you disagree with them, you are in error. So this leaves the relativist with the problem, though. You're either going to be saying something that is trivial, and therefore, why pay attention to it? So you like, you know, Haagen-Dazs, Swiss chocolate almond, big deal. But if they're saying that you are wrong if you disagree with my perspective, then it becomes self-contradictory. So that is really the dilemma. That is the problem. It's either trivial and you're saying nothing, or you're contradicting yourself. I was sitting on a plane speaking with someone, and she was telling me that, that everybody has his own individual perspective. I said, well, is that just your own individual perspective? Or are you speaking about how everything works and that if you, people disagree with you, then they would be in error? It's kind of like what Friedrich Nietzsche said, that truth is a matter of personal perspective. It's, it can be a manipulation of power, you know, to, to seize power, calling something true. And therefore, uh, people have to, you know, in a culture, they kind of buy into it. And you can, truth is kind of manipulable. It's a mobile army of metaphors, he said. But he said that there are no facts, only interpretations. But you have to ask the question, is that a fact or just an interpretation? Have you ever noticed this about Nietzsche's name? Look at all those consonants that are kind of crammed in. You know, you got the T, Z, S, C, H. I like to tell my students that, you know, his name needs a little bit of a vowel movement in there. <laughs> got all these consonants kind of packed in there. <clears throat> Let me say something uh, about uh, the question of, uh, of tolerance and judging very briefly here. Relativists will throw out these terms, and I think it's important for us to understand what the classical understanding of these terms is and what the contemporary abuse of these terms is. Now, when we talk about tolerance, and again, it's helpful to ask people, what do you mean by tolerance? We see that in the classical sense, tolerance means putting up with what you take to be disagreeable or false, or maybe just maybe the way pe some people are. We put up with them. We put up with people who snore on a plane. Now, we put up with somebody whose body odor isn't the greatest near us on the plane. We just put up with those sorts of things. And Colossians reminds us that we have to bear with one another. And this is very biblical. But the problem is that in the contemporary view, tolerance means that we accept all views as true. We accept and even celebrate all of these views, even if they're contradictory. We accept them as true. The problem with that is we just, the term tolerance itself suggests something negative that is built into it. We don't tolerate chocolate, for example. We don't tolerate the music of the composer Johann Sebastian Bach. By the way, he's decomposing now. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> this is what Dorothy Sayers says about tolerance. She says, in the world, it calls itself tolerance, 
but in hell it is called despair. It is the accomplice of the other sins and their worst punishment. It is the sin which believes nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, loves nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and only remains alive because there is nothing it would die for. That is this modern understanding of tolerance, nothing to live for, nothing to die for. And it is a great sign of alienation from God, isn't it? And a great gospel opportunity, which we'll talk about in a moment. Matthew 7, a lot of the relativists like to quote this. The only time they'll quote Jesus is right here. Probably the most famous verse now in our postmodern era. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. What was that? Got hit with that last week. Yeah, okay, well, let's talk about that. When, when you ask a person, well, what do you mean by judging? They'll say, you're saying that it's wrong to say that someone, you're, you're saying it's, you're, you're telling that person that's, that, that he's wrong. That's, that's judging. Of course, the person who's saying that to you is judging you for judging someone else. Yeah, all right, preach it, sister, all right. <laughs> Now, the, you know, what is inconsistent here, as we've seen, is that people are pointing something out that's wrong with you for pointing out something wrong in someone else's belief or behavior. But people say, well, that's, you know, they, they're basically assuming that that's immoral, that you ought not to judge. But again, in a relativistic world, where did that moral standard come from? That applies to all people. Also, in John 7, 24, Jesus says, don't judge by mere appearances, but make a right judgment. So Jesus is calling for judgment, but it needs to be, again, a, a, a warranted judgment, not a superficial one. Let me just make a few comments here, some concerns regarding uh, you know, some relativism just from the intellectual side, and then we'll just briefly move into uh, sharing your faith. Uh, relativism basically is claiming that people uh, make errors. A lot of times that's the justification for, uh, for buying into relativism because, you know, people are wrong and so forth. Who are we to say that another person has really is wrong and doesn't know and so forth? I could be wrong and so there's this kind of false humility that goes along with it. But even to detect error suggests that a person knows the truth from which there is a deviation. I'll have to skip some of these things. One of the points that we've been coming back to is that truth is inescapable. That to deny truth is fundamentally to admit it, as we have seen. There's also no such thing as lying if truth is relative or what we construct it to be. But we take lying seriously. In a court of law, you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, etc. Also, how do we tell the difference between delusion and sanity if we just take the relativistic approach? You know, a person who's in an insane asylum who thinks that he's Napoleon Bonaparte. Well, that's just true for him. <laughs> but I don't know if you know that how, how Napoleon died. He actually died in an explosion. That's why he's called Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, another point here. J.P. Moreland used his example yesterday about, and I like to use this too, about, you know, when, when he took this student's stereo system and walked out of the room with it, the student told him, hey, you're not allowed to do that. And JP said, you know, why not? And he said, well, you know, that's not fair. He says, well, you know, that student just told him whatever is true for you is true for you. Whatever is true for me is true for me. We shouldn't force our views on other people. So as JP is walking out of the room with it, that student says, you can't do that. And JP then points out, hey, no, when it comes to cheating on exams or sexual, you know, morality, you say it's all relative, but when somebody violates your rights or steals your property, then you say, you can't do that, that's wrong, that's not fair. JP didn't tell the story that continues that this person two weeks later ended up becoming a believer because he saw the connection between God and human dignity and human rights and so forth. I think there's a great new evangelistic method called stealing stereos for Jesus. <laughs> <clears throat> In fact, I wrote to JP, I said, I really like the story. JP said, yeah, it's a great stereo. <laughs> People are selective about relativism. They don't say, you know, that's just true for the pharmacist, but not for me, when you look at their prescription bottle. 
or, you know, it's just true for some people that Paris is in France, but not for, no, they're selective. They'll, you know, God and morality is basically where they restrict their relativism to. Basically, what motivates relativism is that people want to be in charge of their lives, and it somehow cramps their style to be hemmed in by reality, as one philosopher has said. Let me just say a few things that, uh, to, to wrap up here in responding with love to relativists. I think it's helpful to remember that relativists live unstable, convictionless lives that aren't conducive to friendship, which requires commitment, trustworthiness, and so forth. We ought to be those who build that bridge, who go beyond and help people to work out of their own self-absorption as relativists. Relativists are not going to be, you know, it's just not conducive to being a friend of a relativist, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. There's an opportunity for dialogue. Ask good questions for the relativist. Why are you a relativist? A lot of times, sometimes, you know, absolutist answers uh, will come out of his mouth. Also, the importance of grace, being winsome, not trying to shoot down the relativist belief system, but rather helping this person to kind of process how he came to those conclusions and to maybe work through uh, what is inconsistent but in a gracious manner. Also distinguish between a person and the belief that he holds, uh, and all, as well as between truth and attitude. You can speak the truth, but without having a negative or judgmental attitude, as well as distinguishing between what a person holds and that person himself. But if I reject what you believe, it's not a rejection of the person himself. Let me just, I'm gonna skip this here and I'm gonna to go to this first point here. It's taken from a book um, where, where it basically is, uh, is talking about people who have come out of postmodernism to believe in Jesus Christ. And I wanna emphasize the first point in particular, that they have to cross this first threshold of moving from distrust to trust that a lot of relativists have an authority problem, that they have not had that kind of a proper basis for trusting authority. They've been skeptical of authority. And so what people need to see in our own lives is a trustworthy person, that, they, that we are the fifth gospel to them, that they need to see that we are Jesus before they'll read about the Jesus in the gospels. And so we have an opportunity to build those bridges of trust with people that that is the first step. Rather than just trying to beat them up intellectually for Jesus, we build bridges with them through friendship. This is gonna be that first threshold, moving from distrust to trust through relationship. Let me just close with this story. I was speaking as, when I was working with Robbie Zacharias International Ministries, I was speaking with someone who had come to a dinner and he said, I was a relativist just like what you're describing. He said, I was self-absorbed, I was living for myself, I didn't have any standards, but I met a girl, I really liked her, but she broke up with me precisely because she couldn't build bridges with someone who didn't want to make a commitment, who didn't believe in the importance of character and integrity. He said, that, got, that really shook me up and it got me searching and it ended up leading me to believe in Jesus Christ as the truth. He said, you see that woman over there? That's the woman who told me to get lost. But now she's my wife because she saw the transformation that took place in my life because of how Christ had touched me, how I'd seen how the truth really matters. And now we're serving Christ faithfully together. That is a picture of the power of the gospel. And the power of the gospel can penetrate the lives of those relativists who think we, they are just unreachable. So may God give you wisdom as you probe, as you discuss, as you try to help them work through their relativism and help them to move from distrust to trust through friendship and ultimately through friendship with Jesus Christ. Thanks very much.